When it comes to great military leaders, few will inspire the imagination of each new generation more than Hannibal, the mighty Carthaginian, who marched 37 war elephants across the Alps in a bid to take on the Roman Empire. Even today, this would be a daring and perilous adventure. But the fact that Hannibal succeeded in his mission in 218 BC makes it all the more incredible. Interestingly, few people remember that eventually, Hannibal went on to lose his battle with Rome, which paled into insignificance compared with his achievement of taking elephants across the Alps. However, the man behind the legend was as remarkable as the stories that surround him. And for the next 60 minutes, we'll embark upon a journey of discovery to find out who Hannibal really was. Now, quickly forgetting all about Hannibal the Cannibal from the pen of Thomas Harris and the Silence of the Lambs, the Hannibal in question here lived before the birth of Christ and has been credited with being an inspiration to many of the world's military leaders, including the French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte and his very British nemesis, the Duke of Wellington. Both men were renowned for being great military strategists. But when we go back in time to when Hannibal waged war on the Romans, we can certainly see where it all began. Of course, the irony here is that Napoleon fought against the Duke of Wellington in the same era, and they both won and lost battles because they were basically using the same tactics. They had even more in common than you might think, because they were both from countries intent on empire building. But here, they differed from Hannibal, who was fighting to prevent his homeland becoming a part of the Roman Empire. If this sounds all too familiar when you hear of conflicts in today's news reports, it's because basically little changes when it comes to history. And despite the names of the generals and the nations involved being different, that's about all that is. So now we've established that the real Hannibal was a historical figure of great importance, who fought many battles, won many wars, and devised the most amazing military strategies that would prove to be the envy of future leaders, we can move on to piecing together the life and times of this remarkable man. It's estimated that Hannibal was born in about 247 BC, when rivalry was fierce between the countries surrounding the Mediterranean Sea. This sea is of vital historic importance for anyone trying to gain an understanding of Western civilization as we know it. Because of its significance as a shipping highway, especially in ancient times. The Mediterranean allowed for trade and cultural exchanges between all the settlers of the region. Whether Greeks, Romans, Egyptians, or Carthaginians, the people of history certainly appreciated the importance of this expanse of water and fought hard for control of it. The Mediterranean is actually connected to the Atlantic Ocean and is almost completely enclosed by land to the west of Asia, the north of Africa, and the south of Europe. From the Rock of Gibraltar at the southern tip of Spain, you can see North Africa on a clear day across the Nine Mile Strait, which does help us to understand how it was possible for Hannibal in Africa to be engaged in a full-scale battle with the Romans across the sea in Italy. 
Hannibal's homeland, Carthage, little more than a ruin today, was situated on the outskirts of the city we know today as Tunis, the capital of Tunisia, sitting in a strategically important position on the Mediterranean coast of Africa. Long before Hannibal was born, the Carthaginians had fought wars with the Greeks to control the Mediterranean area, and they had in fact gained the upper hand. It was only later that they then began fighting with the Romans in Italy for the exact same reason, and this rapidly escalated into an ongoing conflict. Looking back with a 21st century perspective, the people of Carthage were considerably more primitive than their Roman and Greek neighbors, as they still believed it necessary to make human sacrifices to their Carthaginian gods, often slaughtering babies and young children to make these offerings. However, they were much more sophisticated in another respect, as the city of Carthage hired mercenary soldiers instead of training their own citizens, with the nation's economy left to thrive unhindered as the armies went off to war. Also, as you might expect, a nation so dominated by the sea built up a powerful navy and the Carthaginians were able to make the most of their strategic positioning in the Mediterranean. In fact, this didn't just apply to military operations. The Carthaginians were also extremely adept when it came to trade, which allowed them to sustain a profitable economy even after military setbacks. This meant that way back in time when Hannibal was born, Carthage would have been a stunningly beautiful city by the sea. But don't be fooled by the verdant character of the countryside. Almost half of Tunisia, where Carthage once stood, is made up of the Sahara Desert, a huge expanse of hot sand where little survives and nothing will grow. This contrasts dramatically with the very fertile soil along the country's easily accessible coastline that made agriculture possible and ensured Carthage's dominance in the region until, of course, the Romans came along. Hannibal's hatred of the Romans is almost as legendary as his elephants and could be described as inherited. The old adage of like father, like son is very appropriate here. Hamilcar Barca was Hannibal's father and he was also one of Carthage's top generals. Interestingly, the Barca part of his name, translated quite simply as lightning, which described his tactics perfectly and was also applied in later years to Hannibal as well. Hamilcar had always been intent on improving Carthage's fortunes after suffering heavy defeats at the hands of Rome in the first Punic War, when he had been made a general. This war had waged for 23 years and ended just six years before the birth of his son, Hannibal. The primary cause of the first Punic War, and for that matter, the two Punic Wars that would follow, was a mighty clash of interests between two expanding civilizations. The Romans wanted to extend their empire based in Italy, starting with the island of Sicily, which was then controlled by Carthage, and the battle lines were drawn. The wars were named Punic because the Romans spoke the ancient language of Latin, and the term for Carthaginian was Punici, 
which explains why the term Punic was used for the series of wars fought between the two nations. Hamilcar Barca, Hannibal's father, was on his way with the Carthaginian army to raise funds from various tribes who lived in Spain and, in traditional style, made a sacrifice to the gods. The gods were extremely important to the people of Carthage and nothing could be done without consulting them, either through prayer or bloody sacrifice. Hannibal witnessed his father make his offering and begged to be allowed to come and fight alongside him. And Hamilcar agreed on one condition. The boy had to swear to the gods that as long as he lived, he would never be a friend to Rome. History credits Hannibal as swearing that as soon as age permitted, he would use fire and steel to orchestrate the downfall of Rome. An alarming threat indeed, and one that the Romans would soon have to face. However, before we go any further, it's well worth pausing here to take a closer look at who these Romans were, who instigated so much hatred and rage in the Carthaginian people. Like any civilization, Rome began as one small settlement along the river Tiber in central Italy. As with any new city, Rome began attracting people in search of wealth and adventure. Roman soldiers then advanced into nearby settlements and claimed them as a part of Rome. A Senate was soon in session, making laws for the people to follow, and Rome became a republic which quickly prospered. After gaining control of the Mediterranean from the Carthaginians, Rome constantly expanded, ever onwards, to conquer much of the known world. Yet the fall of the Roman Empire came about because it simply got too big to control, as the armies were sent further and further away from home. The Romans nevertheless made their mark upon early civilizations, and with such luxuries as spa baths and central heating, they were most definitely centuries ahead of their time. But for Hannibal's father, the Romans were far from finished as proved when Hamilcar Barca was killed in battle, attempting to reclaim the island of Sicily. Hasdrubal, Hannibal's brother-in-law, took charge of the Carthaginian army and navy, but his leadership was short-lived because in 221 BC, he was slain by an assassin sent by Rome. By this time, Hannibal was eager for a chance to fulfill his promise to bring Rome down. And as the Carthaginian government was evidently impressed by the young man's enthusiasm, they gave him the job. In turn, Hannibal appointed his two brothers as commanders of smaller armies, and these three fearsome Carthaginians made ready to make their late father proud. Almost immediately, Hannibal was caught up in the Second Punic War, which the Romans ironically christened the War Against Hannibal, suggesting that they were already living in fear of this rising military star. The conflict began in 218 BC, and the war became famous for one very important reason. Yes, you've guessed it, the elephants are back trumpeting their return with their mighty trunks. 
When Hannibal took charge of the Carthaginian army, he splashed across the river Ebro in what is now northern Spain to reclaim more territory from Rome that had once belonged to his homeland. It was at this moment that Rome declared a second Punic War against Carthage, viewing Hannibal's actions as distinctly hostile. Fearing the worst, Rome instantly sent reinforcements to the island of Sicily, which had been the catalyst for the first conflict between the two great civilizations, and seemed to be forever caught up in whatever battles were going on. Anticipating that this was what the Romans would do, Hannibal, as a good Carthaginian, prayed to the gods for inspiration. The Carthaginian gods were many and plentiful, and were in many ways similar to Greek and Egyptian gods, all having very specific purposes. There was a god of healing, a goddess of marriage and pregnancy, a god of dawn, a god of dusk, a queen of good fortune and harvest, a god of the sea, and a moon god. In fact, the list seems endless, as if the Carthaginians were taking no chances covering every eventuality. Nevertheless, there were four main gods that the Carthaginians worshipped. Melgarth, Baal Hammon, Tanit, and Eshmon. Melgarth was a water god, very much like Poseidon in Greek mythology, who was god of the sea. Baal Hammon was essentially the lord of the universe, which was rather a grand title, especially as he also had the alternative titles Rider of the Clouds, Almighty, and Lord of the Earth. This is one god that Hannibal would definitely have wanted on his side. The goddess Tanit was linked to good fortune, the harvest, and the moon, and she is also referred to as an earth mother. The symbol of Tanit, which was a truncated pyramid, topped with a rectangular bar, over which is depicted the sun and the crescent moon, can be found on most Carthaginian grave markers, because she was the most important of their gods. Esham was the god of healing and the healing arts. And Hannibal, you can be sure, would have prayed to this god before going into battle in case of injury. These four Carthaginian gods are alleged to have advised Hannibal to ignore the Romans making their way to the island of Sicily, and instead told him to stage an invasion into Italy from the north to completely surprise everybody. This, as the history books now tell us, is precisely what he did, which is why the elephants became necessary. In a lightning campaign, living up to his father's name, Hannibal decided to head straight to Italy, but he would in fact need to cross two mountain ranges. Because nobody had ever tried to attack Rome in this way before, it seemed a crazy thing to attempt, and it truly was the very last thing the Romans expected him to do. Hannibal had the advantage, and this is what marked him as a military tactician to be feared and respected willing to take a calculated risk that would wrong-foot the enemy. Starting with an army of roughly 60,000 men, Hannibal hoped to recruit more troops from the tribal villages along the way, who hated Rome as much as he did. It was a tactic that worked, support grew, and the numbers of the Carthaginian army swelled.
Now before Hannibal, his army and his elephants even got as far as the Alps, they had to contend with the Pyrenees. Like a straight line between the Atlantic Ocean and the Mediterranean, the Pyrenees mountain range forms a natural border between modern France and Spain. The northern slopes are more steep and wet than the southern slopes, and hidden away were many tribes of people, often more interested in survival than Hannibal's stealth-like mission, while others actually were allies of Rome. For this reason, not only did Hannibal lose a lot of men in the Pyrenees, but he also realized that word would get to Rome reporting his movements. However, Hannibal had time on his side. It would take a very skilled messenger to get to Rome before the Carthaginian army, complete with elephants. Steadily, Hannibal had made his way across the Pyrenees, and only then did he reach the Alps. This mountain range is the best known in all Europe, stretching from Austria in the east, through Italy, Switzerland, and Germany, then to France in the west. Its name comes from the ancient Latin as spoken by the Romans, who christened it Alpes, which over the centuries was adapted to become simply the Alps. Today, the Alps are synonymous with skiing holidays, as many exclusive resorts and lodges have developed. But in Hannibal's time, there was no thought of leisure with such a Herculean task before him. Looking at the Alps, you can't help wondering what it was that possessed Hannibal to march such a huge army and elephants for 15 days across the mountains. It was a risky strategy, but back in 218 BC, using elephants to take an army into battle was far from being out of the ordinary. In fact, war elephants, as they were commonly known, were first introduced around 3,000 years ago to be used in the initial charging stages of a battle to cause terror and panic, breaking through the ranks of the enemy and trampling fleeing soldiers. Before this, elephants had been used for heavy work on the land, pulling plows and clearing trees, as well as transportation. There are two main species of elephant, the African and the Indian. Today, we are very fortunate as we have both species side by side, so we can really get a close look at these truly remarkable creatures. The Indian was the first elephant to become domesticated, as their power was harnessed to work for man, and they also began to be used in ceremonial and religious ceremonies. The Indian elephant is smaller than its African cousin, most noticeably in the size of the ears, which will always be the easiest way of distinguishing between them. Also, look at the silhouette. An Indian elephant has a more rounded back, as well as an extra nail on each of their back feet, a few less ribs, and a more prominent forehead. Counting an elephant's toenails would be a really dangerous thing to do, because these animals are incredibly strong, and they need to be treated with the greatest of respect. So we'll settle for the small ears to be sure of our identification on this occasion. With the two elephants side by side, you can immediately see for yourself that the African elephant is taller than its Indian counterpart and will usually be rather more weighty. This may seem to be something of an advantage for a war elephant, but in point of fact, any advantage gained can be lost as the bigger, heavier African elephants are not so easy to maneuver. Now we already know how to distinguish an African from an Indian elephant. And the enormous ears and straight back of this one is a real giveaway, but just take a look at her trunk. 
An African elephant has what's known as two fingers at the end of its trunk to make picking up food easier. There is another difference between the two species as both the male and the female African elephants have ivory tusks, whereas only the male Indian elephant does. In Africa, this has endangered the species, and even though a great deal of work has been done to protect elephants from ruthless ivory dealers, there are still too many deaths of these beautiful creatures at the hands of poachers. With the Indian elephants being the first to become domesticated, needless to say they were also the first to be used as war elephants, and they were even taken overseas to take part in great battles. One of the most memorable, according to the history books, was during the Battle of Guagamela in 331 BC, just over 100 years before Hannibal's crossing of the Alps. This was a battle fought and won by Alexander the Great, who is, without a doubt, one of the most successful, if notorious, of all the military commanders history has ever known. Before his untimely death at the tragically young age of 33, mentally and physically damaged by 12 continual years of military campaigning, Alexander the Great had conquered much of the known world. The army that Alexander faced in 331 BC were well practiced in the art of using war elephants. And at Guagamela they led the charge, causing a great deal of panic among Alexander's normally invincible, highly disciplined fighting men. Fortunately for Alexander, his army had the stamina to be victorious. But as soon as the battle was won, Alexander the Great began using war elephants in his own army, noting the psychological and physical impact they had on the opposition. Yet Alexander the Great was no stranger to using animals in his army. He himself had a quite legendary horse that he rode into battle called Bucephalus. In fact, when the horse died, after being severely wounded in battle, Alexander promptly showed his respect for his equine friend by naming a conquered town after him, which still stands today, but as the city of Jehelam in Pakistan. Legend has it that Alexander tamed this wild horse when he was just a young boy by talking soothingly into his ear and blocking the horse's view of its own shadow and it proved to be a lifelong partnership. Like the war elephants that have been captured in many works of art through history, Alexander the Great and his mighty steed Bucephalus are also depicted in many paintings and mosaics. Now, although Hannibal is most commonly associated with war elephants, Alexander the Great was one of the first military leaders to see their effectiveness and potential. Never one to do anything lightly. Alexander, it is claimed on occasion, used up to 9,000 elephants. But that's another story for another day. Alexander the Great never got as far as conquering Carthage, but he certainly had the city on his wish list. However, a few decades later, the Carthaginians, because of their location in North Africa, adopted the practice of using elephants in battle. The Egyptian approach to war elephants had been to tame the larger African elephants for battle, and of course, the Carthaginians did the same. And then came the Romans, which is when the greatest advantage of using war elephants became evident. 
It's even been recorded in Roman history books that the legions of Roman soldiers were absolutely terrified of them. It was only during Hannibal's last battle with the Romans, some 80 years after the Carthaginians first used the elephants against their Italian oppressors, that they finally worked out how to cope with these magnificent creatures charging towards them at great speed. In the Punic Wars, the elephants were covered by the Carthaginians with heavy armor to make it even more difficult for the enemy's weapons to penetrate their thick skins. The elephants also carried towers on their backs that housed three soldiers, one of whom was the driver, steering the elephant into battle, while the other two were armed with bows and arrows and six meter long spears. So it's hardly surprising that it took the Romans so long to come up with counter tactics. Nevertheless, the famous Roman historian Pliny the Elder stated that elephants could be halted in battle by the smallest squeal of a pig. With the most bizarre tales from ancient history, being told of opposing armies sending in battle lines of pigs to counter the elephants. But however much truth there may or may not be in such tales, curly or otherwise, it was only the advent of gunpowder in the 15th century that really stopped the charging elephants. From that point on, they were allowed to return to an altogether more peaceful way of life, to leave the fighting to men with guns. As delightful as it would be to carry on elephant watching, Hannibal's relentless march into Italy continued, and sooner or later the Romans were going to catch up with him. Crossing the Alps resulted in the Battle of Trebia, as Hannibal had entered Roman territory, but the Romans were nevertheless taken by surprise, as they had prepared to fight the Carthaginians in Spain. Consequently, they had to quickly travel back by sea to defend their land, their honor, and their reputation. This was really good news for Hannibal, as he was able to give his troops a well-earned rest after the arduous mountain crossings. And they were able to prepare both mentally and physically for the much anticipated battle. What was an advantage to the Carthaginians was a distinct disadvantage to the Romans, as they were thrown straight into battle without a rest or even a good meal. Also, Hannibal's clever tactics recruiting men along the way meant that it was harder for the Romans to keep control of the neighboring countries, while the ranks of the Carthaginian army continued to increase. Having brought his elephants such a long way, Hannibal put them to very good use, breaking the Roman line at the Battle of Trebia before they had a chance to make any progress whatsoever. Hannibal's ever-growing invasion force pushed the Romans back into a hurried retreat across the river Trebia, one of the four biggest offshoots from the river Po in northern Italy. The Romans, having lost many soldiers, had been thoroughly outmaneuvered by Hannibal's attack, and they set up camp at the town of Placentia, the capital of Piacenza province, to await reinforcements. This was Hannibal's first victory against the old Carthaginian enemy. And what's more, it was on Roman soil. Interestingly, this area of Italy has recently been involved in historical speculation concerning a great man of a much later age. Many people now believe that the famous explorer Christopher Columbus, who was destined to discover America in 1492, was born in the nearby village of Pradello. 
After winning this first decisive battle, effectively putting the Roman army into a defensive position, Hannibal wanted to consolidate his advantage by pushing further south. But the Roman army were the greatest empire builders the world had ever known, and for very good reason. They quickly regrouped when they realized Hannibal was heading for the capital, Rome. To stop the mighty Carthaginian and his elephants in their tracks, they placed legions of soldiers on the eastern and western routes to the city. The only other option for Hannibal was to march on through marshy swampland, which was virtually impassable because of a spell of heavy rainfall. But Hannibal was determined not to let anything stand in his way, and he forged straight through the bog-ridden land which was near the mouth of Italy's River Arno, pushing his soldiers to the edge of exhaustion. Hannibal also lost all of his war elephants in this quicksand-like soil, which forced the Carthaginians to cross yet another mountain range, the Apennines, on foot. During this long and arduous walk, Hannibal contracted conjunctivitis, which would be no problem for us today at all with over-the-counter ointments readily available. But back in 217 BC, it was a deadly disease. Hannibal did recover, but it cost him the sight in one eye, which was more than he'd ever lost in the heat of battle. The Roman army's strategy had bought them precious time and they regrouped again, while Hannibal was determined to make them follow him, so that he could go into battle on his own terms at his chosen location. Marching beyond the Romans, he effectively cut off their route back to Rome and executed the first deliberate military turning movement in history. The Roman army had to give chase, and Hannibal led them just past Lake Trasimene. There was woodland all around, and the incline of hills allowed Hannibal's cavalry to charge down with their horses at full tilt to ambush the enemy. Men were then sent to light campfires on the hills of Tuoro beyond the lake, so that the Romans would believe the Carthaginian army were camped much further away than they were. This yet again gave Hannibal the element of surprise, a tactic that he used at every possible opportunity. As soon as the Roman army marched into Hannibal's trap with Lake Trasimene close by, the sudden sound of trumpets alerted them to what was about to happen, and the Romans were forced to defend themselves once more. With such careful planning, the Carthaginians were able to cut off the Roman escape swooping down from the surrounding hillsides, and in the space of three hours, the entire Roman army was wiped out. Historians estimate that Roman losses were somewhere in the region of 40,000 men, whereas Hannibal, always one step ahead, lost only 1,500 of his soldiers. But it didn't end there, as Hannibal stayed in the vicinity where he managed to annihilate another 4,000 reinforcement troops from Rome. So terrible was this continuous killing of helpless Roman soldiers that the name of a stream feeding into the lake was christened Sanguinetto, which means blood river, as it literally turned red with the blood of the Roman army as Hannibal fulfilled his promise to his father. The Romans retreated to lick their wounds with Hannibal and his victorious troops left to their own devices while Rome appointed new heads of government and military commanders before mustering a replacement army. 
Hannibal spent his time overthrowing the Apulia, the entire southeastern region of Italy. Preparing for the next battle that would turn out to be the most decisive defeat of the Roman army during the entire course of the Second Punic War. The Battle of Cannae would prove just how brilliant a military strategist Hannibal really was. And as he seized the town of Cannae, a major supply depot for Rome, there was little doubt of his intentions. The Roman army had fresh battalions of soldiers, many of whom were conscripted from neighboring countries under Rome's control. And these allied forces instantly set out to remove Hannibal and the Carthaginians from Italian soil. The Roman army was just a few thousand soldiers short of 90,000 men. And Hannibal, still known to this day as the father of strategy, decided immediately to employ a double envelopment tactic as the Romans approached. In simple terms, he planned to use his army to create a pincher movement that would draw the enemy into a central position where they would be surrounded. The Romans advanced in a block formation, with extra depth rather than width, to try and break straight through Hannibal's V-shaped line. As they did this, the V-shape turned into a crescent and eventually enveloped the whole of the Roman block. Within a very short space of time, the Romans were completely surrounded and then attacked by the Carthaginians on all sides. At the end of just one day, only one in 10 of the Roman army had survived. The casualties were anything between 60 and 70,000 Roman soldiers against about 20,000 Carthaginian losses. The dead from both sides easily exceeded 80,000 men, which is truly shocking and difficult to imagine. This makes the Battle of Cannae, in terms of the number of lives lost in a single day, the bloodiest battle in all of recorded human history. To put this in perspective, that was a third of the total number of American soldiers, sailors and airmen killed in four years of fighting during the Second World War. And this all happened in Cannae in one day. In the aftermath of this horrendous battle, Rome was in complete disarray. And most of southern Italy joined forces with Hannibal in fear for their own lives. But this is where our story becomes intriguing. This would have been the perfect time for the Carthaginians to march on Rome to crush the mighty Roman Empire completely, which is what Hannibal's officers were suggesting. Hannibal was, however, concerned about their lack of equipment and resources to lay siege, perhaps for weeks, to the fortified city of Rome and adamantly refused to proceed. It was a decision that meant Hannibal would become just a footnote in the history of the Roman Empire rather than its conqueror, and his officers could see the writing on the wall. One of his cavalry commanders, horrified by Hannibal's intransigence, summed up the view of the Carthaginians perfectly. Truly the gods have not bestowed all things upon the same person. Thou knowest indeed, Hannibal, how to conquer, but thou knowest not how to make use of your victory. Rather than continuing in battle, Hannibal attempted to negotiate a peace treaty which was refused point blank by Rome. The Romans were so enraged by their losses in the Second Punic War 
and incensed that Hannibal dared to threaten their beloved capital city. They mobilized every man they could find and banned the word peace from being uttered. The Romans were being motivated by their catastrophic defeats at the hands of the Carthaginians. While Hannibal was failing to press home his advantage, and it would be enough to turn the tables against him. The Romans changed tactics completely, and instead of engaging in full-scale battles, they continually attacked Hannibal's giant army with much smaller legions of soldiers, fighting a war of attrition, aiming to systematically weaken Hannibal's troops. Hannibal did manage to win two more significant battles against the Romans, but neither was decisive, and the Carthaginian government back at home refused to send reinforcements, because these smaller Roman armies were also attacking the city of Carthage. Incredibly, this continual fighting went on for 15 years, and although he achieved way more victories than he suffered defeats, Hannibal was forced to return home in 203 BC to protect his homeland from a Roman invasion. With hindsight, it's very easy to blame Hannibal's failure to conquer Rome on his decision to try for a negotiated settlement. But he simply lost momentum and underestimated the will of the Roman people as well as the army. The return of Hannibal to Carthage instantly injected new hope and energy into the exhausted troops stationed around the city. The Second Punic War, which included all the battles that Hannibal had won so decisively, was drawing to a close, with the might of Rome really asserting their renewed strength and power. Hannibal ended up praying to the Carthaginian gods to see whether the final battle, like a chess game, would be a battle of wits or just a lucky strike. And, like a game of chess, would it end with the king, in this case, Hannibal being defeated, rather than simply held in check? The Battle of Zama began in the October of 202 BC. With the forces of Carthage being led by Hannibal, while the Romans were led by Scipio Africanus, who had been a thorn in Hannibal's side ever since the heavy defeat of the Roman army at the Battle of Cannae. Hannibal and Scipio, like two boxers on the eve of a fight, met face to face before the battle. Hannibal pointed out that fate played a large part in the outcome of any battle, and that he had prayed to his gods for victory. He also wanted Scipio to acknowledge how lenient he had been with Rome when their whole civilization had been on the brink of destruction. Scipio saw this as weakness, mocking Hannibal for not conquering Rome when he had the chance, and compared the new Roman army to a phoenix rising from the ashes. Scipio also pointed out that fate is nothing more than chance and that every battle was a game of chance. He declined to accept peaceful terms in order for Rome and Carthage to live in harmony and vowed not to be as weak as Hannibal, promising to finish whatever he started. Zarma, where the last battle of the Second Punic War took place, can be visited today as an archaeological site in northern Tunisia, but for Hannibal it would not hold happy memories. Suffering from mental exhaustion after his many campaigns in Italy, he struggled to find a suitable strategy for this battle. Nevertheless, he had amassed 54,000 men against Rome's 43,000, so on past form he probably felt he had the upper hand. However, Scipio had learned a lot from Rome's previous battles with Hannibal, and his first tactic was to neutralize the freshly acquired war elephants the Carthaginians dispatched first. 
By creating diagonal lines in his troops, the 80 war elephants that Hannibal had mustered just charged harmlessly through the gaps and were then picked off by the rear guards. Scipio had done his homework and knew that elephants could only be taught to charge forward and they were unable to maneuver. In fact, some of the elephants were so upset at being attacked after charging through the Roman lines that they turned around and plowed back into the Carthaginian troops, causing havoc for Hannibal, at which point the Romans returned to their original formation, eliminated the gaps, and continued to march forward. Despite the setback of the elephants, this was nevertheless a very closely fought engagement. Again, Hannibal gained control by using strategy and it almost paid off. But for the Romans, their pride was at stake and they eventually won the day. Carthage had no choice but to enter into a peace treaty with the Romans, but at great cost, as the North Africans were forced to disarm and give up their supremacy in the Mediterranean. Hannibal was only in his 40s, but he was exhausted by a life of continual fighting, and he willingly stepped into the role of chief magistrate for Carthage. So successful was he in this new position that the taxes the Carthaginians were forced to pay Rome were easily raised, while Hannibal and Carthage became more and more prosperous. This worried Rome, and they demanded Hannibal step aside from his position of growing power, which he did going into self-imposed exile. From 195 to 183 BC, Hannibal roamed like a ghost around the Mediterranean, avoiding capture by the Romans who wanted his unconditional surrender. He would offer advice to any military force that asked for it, and even commanded a fleet of ships against one of Rome's greatest allies. For Rome, Hannibal was a nuisance they could do without, and he even invented the first ever form of biological warfare at this time, throwing a cauldron of snakes into the enemy vessels. So once again, with more victories to his name as an independent military leader, the Romans redoubled their efforts to be rid of him. But eventually, the years in battle took their toll. And rather than living in fear of capture by the Romans, Hannibal elected to take control of his own destiny for one last time. In 183 BC, Hannibal swallowed the poison that he'd always carried with him, concealed in a ring worn on his right hand. Ironically, he died in the same year as Scipio Africanus, the only Roman ever to defeat him in battle. What Hannibal leaves as a legacy for the 21st century is a lesson from history that should make the world a more peaceful place. But sadly, the conflicts and arguments that preoccupied Carthage and Rome all those years ago still force young men into battle today. Yet despite all the technological advances of modern warfare, Hannibal is still known as the father of strategy and his ability to think through a battle campaign continues to be legendary. Hannibal's greatest victories were all against superior Roman forces, and his never-say-die attitude offers hope to us all. However, as an interesting postscript for generations of Roman children after his death, Hannibal was anything but a comfort. Parents would warn their offspring that if they were badly behaved, Hannibal would come and murder them. Hardly helpful child psychology, but perhaps it worked, because the sentiment has lived on in an expression that we still use today, when we have to face our fears, whatever they may be. In ancient Latin, the phrase used was Hannibal ad portas, which translates as 
Hannibal is at the gates and continues to keep the memory of this incredible man alive. And after all, they do say that an elephant never forgets. So perhaps it's only right and proper that the one man who did more for raising the elephant's profile in history than any other should be remembered forevermore.